So you have to remember, when I work in newsrooms, it's a fact that every Auntie Harry and Meghan story comes from Kensington yeah, Palace. But, but why and if it comes from Kensington Palace, right. why are they briefing against their own grandson? Well, uh, yeah, okay, that's a very... The, the idea. Why are they never in well, I think that's fascinating. about Prince William? Well, we it was them all along. The call is coming from inside the house. Unlike Meghan, Catherine was born to be a royal. To all the royal family defenders out there, how can you be okay with this? How is this even okay? I'm just gonna jump right into this review because <laughs> I'm still steaming. I am still shocked by what I learned from watching the second part of Harry and Meghan, the docuseries. Okay, so let's just jump right into it. And if you wanna know my background, thoughts on the whole thing watch my previous video on part one of the documentary and you can even watch another video that i made on harry and megan a couple months ago so you can get a feel of where i'm coming from and how my feelings have evolved about how they are handling their situation their new public profile since exiting their royal duties so part two of the docuseries starts at their wedding their beautiful wedding they're surrounded by friends and family they're having a wonderful time and then their life begins in nottingham cottage and it seems by all accounts by all accounts everything indicates that their lives together started wonderfully we see photos of them you know living in their little cottage which wasn't an ostentatious palace or anything of that sort it was a tiny little cottage with low ceilings it was old and, and you know <laughs> it's a historical little place but they were happy there they were happy you see them in photos making little repairs to their place um, you see Megan doing a little dance. I wish I could put little clips of the documentary, but I don't want to get a copyright strike or anything of that sort. So we're just going to have to go with the assumption that you also watch the documentary and you know what I'm talking about. But we can see that they were happy. We can see that Megan is not this power hungry person who just wants the trappings of, of royalty who just wants to, you know, have all the crowns and the pearls and the diamonds and all that. They just seem like the really happy couple. They're newlyweds starting out small in their little world. How did we get to the place where we assume that she was this diva that was demanding, that was bullying the staff? The fact that people still believe that without taking into account Megan's background as an actress. Every time you talk to any fellow actor or anybody who worked with her on set, people would refer to her with the warmest of terms. They would talk about how sweet she was to everybody, how she would bake cookies and cakes and bring them and feed everybody on set from her fellow actors to the director, to the grip, to the catering service people to the cleaning lady everybody was made to feel appreciated and seen by megan she would write thank you letters to everybody she was very mindful of remembering people's names and asking them about their families and and she just seemed before all of this to be a very humble person. Remember, she married Harry in her mid-30s. She wasn't some young girl that was still, you know, her, her personality was still developing. No, by the time she met Harry, she was a done deal. She was a made woman. She already had a personality of her own. She had a career. She had a life of her own. And the people who had come across her throughout all these years already knew who she was. So for people to think that this humble, loving, bubbly, happy, welcoming person went from being that to in the snap of a finger, turning into some diva with demands of the staff, bullying them, making them cry. Why would you think that? Unless you wanted to think that. This was all manufactured by the press. The press was behind this public perception of her as this horrible person, as this person who was just in it for, for the fame. They called her, 
you know, me gain instead of Megan. Like she was in it for, for the money and for the fame and for the attention. All the things she already had when she met Harry. And like I mentioned in my last video, Megan lost more than she gained by joining the royal family. Megan had a beautiful life already. She had everything she wanted. Yeah, the only thing that was missing was love. She had already been divorced. That didn't work out. I'm sure she had dreamed. I mean, they, she talked about how they, both her and Harry, had wanted to have kids. And um, I can imagine being a, a, a budding actress, a very successful, and by success, I don't mean that she was in the A-list because people say, oh, you know, she wasn't an A-list actor. Okay, she wasn't. But her little gig was enough to give her a really good life where she could have her own home. She was well taken care of. She had all the luxury she needed. She had her friends and family. She could travel the world. She was being a humanitarian. She, she, she was following her passion. And a lot of that was taken away when she married Harry. A lot of that, the goodwill that she had worked so many years to build for herself, um, her good name, her reputation as a humanitarian, as a, as a respectable, hardworking, humble person who can work with just about anybody, who can fit into any cast and crew, that was stripped away from her. So no, she didn't gain anything. She lost, but she took the loss because she loves her husband. She's not the person who does things for attention. They talked about the ladies who were displaced by the fire in the, this building that was housing lots of immigrants and refugees. It caught a fire. A lot of people were displaced, a lot of people died. And Megan immediately did what Megan had been doing for decades. She jumped into action and she said, I wanna help, let's help. What are we gonna do? And this is just who she was. This wasn't something that she did for show. She really cares about people. And it's one of the reasons why Harry fell in love with her because she reminded him of his mom and she reminded him of the, the good qualities within himself. But it was clear from the very beginning that the press was going after her. And even after the early embarrassment with her dad, the whole fiasco that happened and could have ruined the wedding at some point they kind of backed off and they were actually saying nice things about her they were still throwing digs here and there but they saw how popular she was and remember these newspapers they are here to make money and the way they make money is by talking about things that the public is interested in and megan was extremely popular in the UK and all over the world. And so every time they put her on the cover of their, their little tabloids or the magazines or they put them on their website, they got lots of clicks and views, got lots of people buying their tabloids. And so for a while, it seems like Megan was taking all the shine away from her sister-in-law, who before her, she was the it girl in the family. Well, here comes a more it it girl coming in to, to take her shine, to, to take the spotlight away from the people who really... Here's the thing. Harry was never really in contention for the line of succession. The moment William got married and started having children, Harry's position kept getting pushed down and down in the line of succession, much to Harry's delight, I'm sure, because it's clear that he never really wanted to be any kind of a senior royal. So there was very little chance, barring some sort of horrible tragedy, that Harry and Meghan would ever be king and queen of the United Kingdom, right? So it is important that the most popular royals are those that are poised to take on the throne. Because as we know, the royal family relies on their popularity to be able to maintain their position as heads of state. So because Harry and Meghan were never going to be king and queen, it was more than just a nuisance if they become the most popular, the most visible, the most charismatic members of the royal family. And Harry understood this because in the documentary, he talked about how in the beginning of their marriage, doesn't matter how Meghan tried to play down and be in the back and not be so visible, 
the press always focused on her when the family was together. And he immediately knew, ooh, this is gonna be a problem. Why did he know this? Because when his parents were still married and Diana, not Charles, became the spotlight, she became the most popular royal member, it created friction in the marriage because Charles was jealous. And no, we don't know this just because we saw it on The Crown, but Diana spoke about this in that infamous interview with Mr. Bashir. So then the Australia trip happened, which was, I believe, their first official joint trip as a couple, Harry and Meghan. And she was also pregnant. They announced her pregnancy while they were on that tour. It was a massive success. They were incredibly charismatic and likable and the people loved them. I remember watching the tour and I've never been much of a royalist, but once Meghan comes into the picture, I became more interested in the royal family. And I remember following the news of their Australia trip and how good they looked and how relaxed and how much of a natural she looked. A lot of times with Kate, you get this feeling of stiffness and this is no this is no shade to Catherine and I'm going to talk a little bit more about Catherine later in this video because I believe that unlike Megan Catherine was born to be a royal she was born for the role but I'm going to talk about that a little later but I just remember seeing how much of a natural in contrast to Kate Megan looked speaking to people in front of a camera. She didn't have to be reading from a script. She was just just ad-libbing. She seemed really happy to meet all these people and the people felt really embraced by her. That became the beginning of the end because I believe William, Charles, Camilla, and yeah, even Kate saw this and they thought, how can we compete against this? How can we match this? I mean, he's such a natural jokester. He's very good with people. And now this trained actress, this public speaker, this woman of color who looks like she could be anything. She could be black. She could be Indian. She could be Asian. She could be Native American. She could be of another native group of people. She's just every woman. She looks Arab. She looks Persian. She looks Armenian. I mean, she, she has that racially ambiguous look where everybody can see themselves. That is a very lucrative look to have in this globalized world, in this social media world. This is the look that you can make lots of money and get lots of attention from. So immediately, I believe the senior members of the royal family decided Omerta, <laughs> we need to just, <laughs> we need to take her out. We, we need to do something. We need to kind of tamp this down because the attention should be on us. We are the ones who are going to be ruling over all these peasants. And so we need them to like us and not them. And so we don't need to get into all of this. Everything that the press did to make Megan look bad, to discredit her, to paint this picture of this horrible person who's mean to the staff, who is in it is an, in a money grab, and she's a social climber. And we also have heard the effect this had on Megan. How in the midst of suffering through not just postpartum depression, but prepartum depression, she went to a really dark place. And I remember when she talked about this in the Oprah interview, how the royalists and the people who don't like her were so scathing and saying, I don't believe her. She was never thinking about ending herself. That was never the truth. She's just saying that because she wants attention. And I remember there was a tweet, I wish I had screen grabbed it, where somebody was saying, Megan is probably not going to see your tweets saying that she's lying about her thoughts of ending her life, but your friend or family member who follows you on Twitter, who is probably struggling mentally and probably contemplating that, they can see your tweet. People can be so cruel, 
once they decide I don't like you I don't want to have anything to do with you I'm gonna discredit anything you say to the point where we almost lose our sense of humanity our sense of empathy and it is you know it's nothing really surprising in this era of social media trolls there's nothing really surprising about it but I want to get to the thing that to me settled this whole thing in my mind that the royal family are trash they are horrible people they are the worst and once again this is not the thing that is capturing all the headlines everybody was talking about the deep curtsy that Megan did to show how inadequate she was in the beginning how she didn't know how to curtsy and how she made a fool of herself the first time she met the Queen but people decided to say oh she's she's mocking the Queen by doing this curtsy she's mocking herself but anyway you know <laughs> being able to to, to, to get a joke is, is something that is being lost every day but the thing that really should have been the headline was the story about the lawsuit about the letter that was leaked to the press and it caused Megan to sue the press. Now, I remember when I first heard about this, assuming that what was leaked to the press was portions of the letter that Thomas Marco got from his daughter. And as disgusted as I was with Mr. Marco, I, you know, I put on my practical hat on and I thought, well, I mean, can you really sue the press for publishing something that was given to them by Megan's father? The moment he receives that letter, that letter becomes his property and he can do with his property whatever he wants unless he signs some kind of a document swearing that he would never share this with anybody. There was nothing really preventing the Daily Mail or any of these other newspapers from publishing it. If it's coming from Thomas, the letter belongs to Thomas. It came to him from his daughter. It's in poor taste, but hey, if you give me the letter, I'll publish it. If you give me the, the voicemails between you and somebody, I'll publish it. How can you sue them? I, I, I remember thinking that, and then when I heard that she had won, I was like, oh, well, I mean, the, the freedom of speech laws in the UK are really different from here in America. Because here in America, she wouldn't have a chance of, a, of, of, of even getting the lawsuit any traction. Because again, the letter came to Thomas, Thomas received the letter, and then he decided to sell it to the tabloids. And in a case like that, why would you sue the newspaper? You should sue your father. He's the one who gave them the letter but that was the story that i had in my mind they published the letter that thomas marco received come to find out that's not what was published what was published was a draft of the letter that she eventually sent to thomas in the mail meaning what the press got, what was leaked to the press, was something that Thomas Markle never received. Because it was a draft. You know what a draft is, right? With a draft is when you write the first Passover of the letter or whatever document. And then you start looking at it. You start picking it apart. You think, okay, let me, let me take this part off. Yeah, I shouldn't say this. And then, oh, I forgot to say this. And then you add that or you, you kind of scratch it there. And then you're like, mm, let me move this to the end because I think it will have more impact if I say this at the end. That's what a draft is. It's the first run. It's where you make your corrections. And then the finished letter is what was sent to Thomas. But the press didn't leak the letter that Thomas received. The press leaked the draft. And there were only two people who had the draft, Meghan Markle and the palace staff that she went in a back and forth with them. I'm sure this is how it works. Once you belong to a certain family, once you are betrothed to the royal family, you don't just write things and send them out. No, it has to go through the PR people, the staffers, your press people because they have to make sure that whatever it is that's leaving the palace 
it's in the right decorum it is written in perfect english there's nothing in that letter that's going to embarrass the royal family there's nothing in that letter that's going to give away secrets of the royal family it's almost like it's literally like being in prison <laughs> If a prisoner is writing a letter, it has to go through the warden and they have to go through and redact anything that may not be appropriate for people outside to know about. There's just a way of doing things. And so we know that Megan didn't leak it to the press because she turned around and sued the press. <laughs> and if she had had anything to do with the leak, it would have come out in the trial and it would have been a horrible embarrassment for her. So Megan didn't leak it. So the palace, the palace leaked it. It was them all along. It was them all along. The call is coming from inside the house. You know that famous line. There's this scary movie where there's this suspense where somebody's being stalked or being terrorized by somebody. And sometimes they call and they, you know, they, they threaten the person picking up the phone call. And once the police trace the call, they let the person know, hey, this person who's calling you, who's torturing you, who's, who's making life hell for you, the call is coming from inside the house. And for anybody doubting that it was really leaked from the palace, this, I, I wrote this down. I, I had to write it down because I was like, I, I, I'm not tripping. I'm not tripping. They sh in the documentary, they show a written document and it says, editor of the Mail on Sunday stated in court documents that a senior member of the royal household gave him drafts of the letter Megan wrote to her father. How? <laughs> To all the royalists out there, to all the royal family defenders out there, how can you be okay with this? How is this even okay? To clarify, Harry and Meghan never said verbally that the letter that was published was leaked by the palace. I surmised this by looking at the document that they presented. It was very clear from looking at that document what they were talking about. It referred to several drafts of the letter. And as you know, as I explained, Thomas Markle didn't have the drafts. Those drafts were held by the palace. That's how I came to the conclusion. You can pause and look at the document again and you can decide, read it because it says clearly the editor met with a senior member of the household and they received several drafts of the letter. Okay. So the editor on the, of the Mail on Sunday is lying? Is, is, that, is that your position? The editor of the Mail on Sunday is making it up? That woman who I played in the beginning of this video when she said she knows for a fact that all the negative press Meghan and Harry were getting was coming from Kensington Palace, the home of William and Kate. She's lying too? Is that what we're going with? All these people are lying. All these people who still have their jobs. I think so. I'm going to check. But these people who still have their jobs in the press, they're all lying. And, and Meghan and Harry are lying. Like one day they just woke up and they're like, Let's make some stuff up. Let's make life more interesting. Let's just make things up. Let's start a fight for no reason. You really believe this? Diana said the exact same thing. She said, they are leaking negative stories about me in the press because I won't go quietly. All these people are lying. All these people are lying. And the royal family the institution that has been ruling with an iron fist for thousands of years, who have been pillaging and raping and stripping people of their resources, all those beautiful crowns and jewels that you see them wearing, they're all stolen from Africa, from India, from the Americas. They've enslaved millions of people. You believe their word over all these people. Okay. Okay. Nice, nice, nice. They were the ones doing it all along. It was them all along. Now you understand what the feud between the brothers is about? 
now you understand. What else, what could cause these two brothers who love each other, who've been through the best of times and the worst of times together, who lost their beloved mother in such a traumatic way, and they had no one to hold on to but each other, what would cause that bond to break? You know what would cause it to break? When you're the youngest brother, when you're the most sensitive brother, when you're the one who is suffering incredibly, but you feel, you know, if I have nothing in this world, I have my William, I have my brother. And when the press starts attacking your, your beloved, the love of your life, and you run to your brother crying, and you're like, please help me. Why are they doing this? And your brother's like, it's okay, brother, it's okay. Just ignore them. It will go away. It will go away. We, we will protect her. Don't worry. And then you get married, and then she gets pregnant, and she's suffering, and she's thinking about ending it all. And you run back to your brother and your dad and your grandma, and you beg them, please help me. Please help us get some help from my wife so this doesn't happen. Please, I've already lost my mom. You know, William, you know this. Please help me. And William looks you in the eye and says, it's okay, brother. You know, we, we'll figure it out, but just just stay low. Just just lie low. We're going to help you. Trust me, but but just just stay down. And then you find out that your brother, your William, your your comforter in your darkest times, he's now one of them. He's now working with them against you. For the love of power, that's what would cause a rift between those two brothers. Now I understand, I get it now. It's not some, oh, you were mean to my wife. Oh, your wife doesn't talk to my wife very nicely. Your wife made my girlfriend cry. Mm, I don't like this. Let's not talk. <laughs> For the longest time, I couldn't. I'm like, but you guys, I mean, Diana, you know, if, if you believe she's in heaven looking down, don't you think this is breaking her heart to see that you two don't talk to each other? Why, why can't you just find a way to, to come back together? Because Harry lost his brother. Harry lost his brother. He's, he's not his brother anymore. It's not them against the world. It's William and the world against him and Megan. That's why. And when the call is coming from inside the house, the house is not safe anymore. It's time to get out. And that's what Harry said. We need to get out of here. The fact that when uh, the lawsuit was ongoing and it was William Staffer who provided a text message from Megan when she was going back and forth with him because at the time that staffer that now works with William was working with Megan and Harry I guess he was the one who was you know sending the draft back and forth between the palace's press office and Megan like okay you need to change this you need to um, arrange this you need to blah, blah 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 she sent him a text saying you know I'm afraid that you know this could potentially be leaked this information could potentially be leaked that same staffer who now works for William provided this text in the lawsuit to help the press prove that, yeah, you were sending this draft back and forth and you had a reasonable expectation that at some point it was going to leak. The fact that that staffer provided help for the press being sued by Harry and Megan, I think it was Megan only in that lawsuit, it just sealed the deal that the call was coming from inside the house. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was good. And for people to say, oh, but that was the staffer. No staffer can say anything without the permission of senior members of the royal household. They can't do that. They can't independently say, oh, let me send this information that the court might need. Shameful and shameless at the same time. Harry was shocked at the lengths his own brother would go to kind of cover himself when him, William, and the family sent this joint statement between Harry and William saying, oh, and those statements about my brother bullying my wife, they were not true. And the fact that, 
The fact that Harry was so emphatic in saying that was a lie, <laughs> that was Harry saying, yes, my brother did bully my wife out of this family. <laughs> he couldn't have said it any plainer, which confirms that the leaks, including the draft, it all came from William and his press people. What a, you know how they say power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The fact that William would turn his back on his little brother, his, his partner in, in, in crime, in life, in pain and sorrow, but in joy. The fact that his desire for the, 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 the crown would make him turn his back on his little brother. It just goes to show the kind of coldness that you need to do this job. And which brings me to Catherine. I like Kate. I like her. Um, like I said, I believe that she was made for this job. Why is that? From the very beginning of her joining this family, Kate went through something very traumatic. You remember when her honeymoon photos where she was naked were leaked into the press or at least into the internet? Somebody with a very long photo lens took pictures of Kate in a private villa surrounded by greenery. You know, th th she had a reasonable expectation of privacy when she stepped out naked. You know, it's her honeymoon. She's with her husband. She's being all cute and sexy for him. And somebody with a very long photo lens on it. I wonder, I wonder if other senior members of the royal family arranged for that to happen. Because how would the press know where they were? How would the press alert them? Okay, they're going to be staying in this exact villa. And I want you to train your thing. But anyway, let me not, let me not, <laughs> let me not judge. But that was very traumatic. And I remember when that happened thinking, oh my goodness, if the royal family don't even have privacy, my Lord, I mean, it's horrible out here. And Kate went through that trauma. She maintained that stiff upper lip. She stayed calm and carried on. She didn't, you know, she didn't complain. She didn't do any interviews talking about it. She, she steeled her back, that back of, of steel that she has. And she said, you know what? I'm going to continue doing what I got to do. And I'm going to continue going to events and I'm going to show my face. And this was embarrassing and this was shameful, but I have a job to do. This is chess, not checkers. I'm looking at the long game. They're not going to bully me out of here. That's what it takes to do this job. But here's the difference between her and Megan. When this happened to her, the royal family rallied around her. Statements were issued from the royal family condemning this. The whole world stood beside her. Everybody put their arms around her. Everybody said this was so unfair. Nobody could have said anything about her that was, oh, why were you naked? Again, honeymoon, privacy. There was no one there but her and her man. It was just the two of them. She had a reasonable expectation of privacy. She had every right to be naked with her man, okay? So everybody was in one accord to support and embrace her and, and just protect her, as they should. And they should have done the same for Megan. And the thing about it that was also different is that this was a horrible, embarrassing thing that happened to Kate but it's something that everybody could relate and say, Psh, it could be me. That could be me. That could be anybody in a moment that you think you're by yourself and it happened to her. This is terrible. But the attacks on Megan were attacks on her character. They were attack on her as a person and her, her motives and her reputation. And she didn't have the backing of the royal family. And she didn't have a united front of the press. Because even, I believe, if I'm missed, I don't think any of the major publications published it. I think it was published online, but I don't think any of the actual British papers published those pictures. I really don't think so. So even the press stood behind Kate. 
But Megan didn't have that. So it's not the same. At the same time though, Kate really, she really has what it takes to be the, the queen, the head of this evil empire. But um, yeah, Kate the Great, she'll be a great queen if, if the royal family, if the monarchy is still standing. Because something tells me that Charles and Camilla are exactly what the anti-royalists need to kind of, you know, bring this whole thing down. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. Another thing that had always been said about um, Harry and Meghan is that they blindsided the Queen with their announcement that they were going to be stepping down from their um, obligations, from their royal engagements. It was not. And I believe Harry. You know why I believe them? Because everything they're saying makes sense. There's, this is not the kind of thing that you kind of talk in secret and then you just release it without talking to people. It had been rumored for months that they were going to be leaving the UK and moving into another part of the Commonwealth. And again, this just shows that there were all these leaks coming from the palace. Harry talked about, they first talked about moving to maybe South Africa or any other countries in the continent. And it leaked to the press. When it was private conversations between Harry and his family, it leaked to the press. Then they said, okay, maybe we will move to, I don't know, maybe to Australia, maybe we'll go to Canada. And it was leaked to the press. And then before they even made the official announcement that they wanted to kind of step down and kind of allow the senior members to have the shine that they so desperately wanted, that stuff was leaked to the press. And when he was talking to his dad, um, when Harry was talking to his dad and saying, listen, I, I would like to do this thing about maybe going to Canada and maybe staying there and having a smaller role so you guys can be the seniors. And the dad said, okay, I need you to send me this in writing. And he's like, dad, but every time I write it, it ends up in the press. He's like, no, no, we will not discuss this further if it's not in writing. So he wrote it down, sent it to them, got leaked to the press. <laughs> You really can't make this up. You literally cannot make this up. So I believe them. I truly believe them. In the end, I'm happy for Meghan and Harry. I'm glad they got out. I'm happy that they found a way to make a life of their own. They have their own created new family. Doria is there. I love Doria. She just has this calming presence to her. Um, they have Doria being the doting grandma that she is to her beautiful grandchildren. Um, they have, he has his cousin Eugenie. But I'm, I'm glad that they have the family around them that they need to have, that they have their friends. They have a really beautiful, rich life. Their children seem so cute and so happy and they're having the upbringing that William and Kate's kids will not have. They will not have that freedom of riding their bikes on the beach and, you know, going to school with regular children, of just being able to go on vacation and, and, and have fun and be themselves and not have to pose for arranged photo shoots for the press, the press that could one day turn on them just as easily as they turn on their aunt and uncle. I hope Kate and William know that just because they're still under the auspices of the press and they're being kind to them, I hope they understand that this could switch in a moment. They can say the wrong thing. They can do something. Charles could say something that would piss off the press. And then they decide to attack. Remember that horrible photo of Kate that she looks 60 years old? Somebody was angry. Something happened. I heard rumors that it was Camilla who felt jealous that Kate is getting all the shine and now that Camilla is the queen, the queen consort, that she wasn't liking how she was getting all this press. Oh, the, um, the Princess of Wales looks so beautiful. Oh, the Princess of Wales, the Princess. Of... Now she's getting all the, the shine that Camilla wants. So I heard, I don't know if this is true, that Camilla called somebody at that newspaper and said, hey, can you, can you do a little bit of exposure to make her look really old and ugly? They eat each other, honey. But I know you got the, the backbone to, to, to handle it.
because you have your eyes on the prize, honey, and I don't blame you. I don't blame you, honey. Get your crown. You have earned it. Yeah, so I'm happy for Harry and Meghan. I always believed, I always believed that if Diana had lived, she would have ended up here in the United States, either in New York City or here in LA. I always imagined that she would end up in one of those places. And when Harry said that, at the end of the documentary, he's like, you know what, to end up living here in California, a place that I know my mom had wanted to end up living in. I was like, oh. He really is his mother's son. So that is my take on part two of Harry and Meghan. Let's talk about it in the comment section, guys. Let's let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> Round two, tell me. Do you, okay, L let me be very clear because we can tend to canonize people that we like. I like Megan and I am on her side, but I can also recognize that there are things about Megan that she really needs to work on. Megan seems to have visions of grandeur of herself. She seems to be very self-aggrandizing. She seems to be extremely thin-skinned that everything bothers her. She can't seem to understand that, you know what? This is bothering me, but I'm gonna keep my mouth shut because I don't wanna seem weak. I wish she were more like Catherine in that sense, but she ain't no Catherine. She ain't Kate. And I'm not gonna hold her to that standard. But, you know, I, I wish that she were more you know, she, she didn't give them what they wanted. The trolls want to see her on her knees begging for, for recognition. When she made that statement, when I was on the plane, the, the, uh, a staffer from the, the airline came up to me and said, I want to thank you for your service. And it was the only time that I received recognition. It's like, you don't have to say that, Megan. Don't say that. You come across as whiny and self-importance and nobody liked that. Just stop that. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. It do, it's not a good look. Be strong. Cry in the background. Collapse into the arms of your love and cry to him. But when you stand in front of the camera, you tell them, I don't care about y'all. I'm gonna do what I gotta do. I'm gonna do my humanitarian work. I'm gonna do my, my, my celebrity things. And if you don't like it, look away. That's what I want to see you doing because they're going to talk about you anyhow. Don't give them anything. And you too, Harry. After this book, I understand. I already said in the last video, I understand why you had to write it. You need the money. Okay, I get it. But after this, no more complaints. Unless you discover some, some major thing that has to come out. Yeah, you point it out. You do it. Okay, thank you so much for watching. Oh my gosh, this is so long. I'm gonna have to do a lot of editing of this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to hear my opinion on other topics such as this one, I'll probably do more videos talking about this. Um, please subscribe to my channel. I would love to have you join our little growing family. We're approaching 500 subscribers. I'm so excited. Um, thank you so much for, for watching my videos. Stick around. Look around, see if anything else catches your fancy and leave a comment. Be respectful as, as usual. You guys are pretty respectful. I have to say, even when you disagree with me, I appreciate your, your tone. Thank you so much. Um, uh, leave a like if you like this and I will see you in the next video. Bye.